and you have the kids who have 123 options of what they think they're gonna do. When I was four, I wanted to be a fireman, then a doctor, an astrophysicist, then I was convinced I would go into trading from the age of 12. Trading from the age of 12. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Johan Turpin, a math genius and the founder of Wintermute. One of the leading global crypto market makers. Providing liquidity on over 50 exchanges and trading platforms. Why is it so important to not focus on the competition? I think focusing on competition could be discouraging when it looks like competitors are big, while they actually may not be. What is Wintermute today? We do three things essentially. So we're the core part of the business is we're the largest spot crypto market maker. Between winter and summer, we cover 250 to 350 tokens across 80 venues and then we have about 15 percent market share in entrepreneurship resilience is really seen as the key strength you should never quit but you told me that resilience could be a bad trait <laughs> why i think too much resilience may just mean that you may not be able to discern what's good and bad feedback resilience is only useful if you're actually going in the right direction you need to be assertive enough about what you're doing but you also need to listen enough to other people some investors may be noisy but some investors may have very useful feedback for you so you need to be able to filter through that noise and that's not an easy thing to do. You've been working super hard, sleeping four hours a night, going through multiple businesses, making a lot of money, going through a marriage that didn't work, then going through another marriage. Mm -hmm. What's the key learning from these last crazy 10 years? Um. Cheers and let's start actually Cheers. with the basics, which is who are you? Oh, who am I? That's a pretty deep question to start with. So uh, I will try to keep it as high level as possible, but essentially, so I'm French born, um, very much born in the north of France as a, what some people would call, you know, Sti as such, so very much in a mining town, even though I was essentially the son of a dentist. Mm. Um, so it's called a bit of a bourgeois, such in a communist town in the north of France. So that, that, um, that, that gives a bit of context. The other context is that essentially my father's side of the family is more of a industrial Catholic family. So it used to be fairly wealthy as such and on, on, in, in the paper industry side. So people who had their names in the, in the family books and so on. And on my mother's side, uh, she's the daughter of a unionist, a glassblower, uh, who used to, you know, just, just make glass, but he, who became, um, a unions for representative of, you know, employees and so on. They, they can be part of essentially uh, pension management, and actually, so both both sides, you know, pretty smart and they, they they got along quite well at the end. But essentially, there was a bit of a um, interesting, you know, more cultural sort of a social split, basically in terms of like you know managing two very different sides of the family as a, as a kid. Um, so that's that's one one aspect. A second aspect is probably when you're at school. You have the kids who basically have no idea what they're going to do. And you have the kids who have about 123 options of what they think they're going to do. And I was on the second, <laughs> second category. So, so when I was four, I wanted to be a fireman, then a doctor, then uh, I wanted to be an astrophysicist until the, the age of about 12. And then it, when I was convinced I would go into trading from the age of 12. Trading from the age of 12. Yeah. So, and then from the age of 12, essentially. I was running through, um, probably remember the, the Figaro magazine as such. So they, they have basically financial pages. So they're own sort of Salmon pages. So I'll go through that when I was quite, quite young. And essentially, I, I think I basically managed to convince my dad so that I would uh, go and, you know, manage essentially the, the stock, the family stock portfolio. So at 12, at 12 years old, <laughs> so so your dad was investing. So I was, I was already, it was more investing than trading to be quite honest. It was more like. Uh, so you, you imagine like a 95, 96 or so. So it's all the, uh, some of the, um, you know, the early French IPOs and so on. So, mm -hmm. so we'd review this and I would go on the mini tail and think it was page six, six, three, seven, the credit, credit Lyonnais, and then go and like type in, type things in and just buy, it would just be tiny sizes. It would be like a few thousand, uh, euros equivalent at the time. Um, but it basically, I built some track. And the funny thing is I would actually get, already get paid a performance fee. So I had, at I had, 12. I had, yeah, I had no high watermark. So, <laughs> so wait, so dentist father. Yeah, exactly. And he was, so the, they already had this kind of philosophy of investment for their own money they were doing. Yeah, but he, he, could, he was mostly like a real estate, like he would, okay. he would be like more into real estate and so on. He had a stock portfolio and then. I mean, I think my parents were quite 
quite quite quite happy first and then a bit scared later of just uh you know empowering me with this um <laughs> but but essentially i would get like you know 10 percent commission on like you know the the winnings and then no one would call recall the money when when things didn't work out uh so i had a I had a pretty good deal at the time so I basically build up a pot of money and then i ended up um you know a magazine called Investy, or whatever investing yep. uh had basically an option guide that was published uh on matif and monep so i read through this and when i was 15 and you couldn't trade options as you know as an individual especially not at 15 at the time so in, in 98 um but what you could do is you could buy warrants um i didn't really know how expensive you know things things were sort of such but uh but i ended up just trading some warrants until it's sort of between 15 and 18 and so on and then it went on like this so basically uh um uh, through through with a small loan from my dad of about five thousand euros equivalent i managed to get so i went through more like a french you know uh, uh so uh, an, an economics track and I went to uh, a prep, sort of class prepa, sort of uh, to prepare you to a business school. Mm-hmm. And as part of the business school, I basically I had the first internship that I that I did. I managed to somehow um, get validated to for me to spend three months gambling on CAC forty futures uh, as an internship. Okay. <laughs> so what do you mean by gambling on? Well, I was I was trying to 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 show that I could make money trading, you know, CAC forty futures essentially. And and with with hindsight, as like it was, it wasn't that structured. Um, I didn't actually lose money. I would, uh, I spent a lot of money in fees, um, but uh, but that was the next stage. And uh, the funny funny detail there is that I managed to get someone at a uh, Bourse Arma. You you may know, so it's, I think it's been bought by Sogden in between. So so uh, uh, an online French online broker managed to get them to sign me off uh, as a as a as a professional investor at, uh, <laughs> to, to, for me to be able to trade futures at the time. So just before that, you yeah. told me that you grew up in a mining town, right? Yeah. yeah. And that you are from parents who did pretty well, but you were surrounded with people who were immigrants mm. and working really hard. Yeah. So it was, it was an interesting, um, or whatever you can call it, a dichotomy or a split as such. So we were living with enough money not to care about money, not too much either, mm-hmm. but enough money to go to winter sports and so on. And essentially, we were told, like, don't tell anyone you go to winter sports. Uh, it's not, you know, the French culture is like, doesn't doesn't make it easy to, you, you've seen, if you say that you do something, it can be seen as showing off, essentially. So they don't want us to uh, to be uh, to be uh, isolated from that, from that perspective. But what's... Um, was well, quite inspiring and probably explains why I'm still pretty hungry as such today is that I, I was essentially brought up with a lot of second, third generation, uh, you know, Polish, Polish, of, you know, uh, parents who, or people had their grandparents who were Polish miners, for example, um, uh, Portuguese, Spanish and so on. So a, a lot of, a lot of immigrants, uh, some North Africans and so on, uh, but mostly, mostly, you know, mostly Polish because of the, of the mines. Um, and I think every single one of my kindergarten and primary school teachers were of Polish descent. Um, mm. So you can imagine the 15 to 20 letters names finishing in ski. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they they, they get, get a lot of practice to, you know, the Lewandowski and then the Lewandowski and then yep. they, 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 they take a bit of practice. Um, with this sort of mindset of, uh, you know, people being, being positively hungry and then positively just quite optimistic about the next generation. So essentially that, you know, their parents, so my teachers basically, their, their, their own parents would have come as come in as minors. They, they became, you know, the teachers and then their own kids would become essentially, you know, the doctors or the, uh, the accountants and, uh, the lawyers and so on. Um, and so and it, it was quite a good, quite a good community and, and the same sort of beyond school. Same sort of philosophy in like the swimming club where I spent hours and hours and hours of my of my childhood. Uh, tennis um, and the music band or so that was quite a good, quite quite well managed and quite a good uh, group to be part of. Mm. So very very strong you know communities as such like as as you'd imagine in in movies about the north of France literally. Very <laughs> the, I have very, one specific uh, movie in mind, <laughs> but it's actually fairly <laughs> it's fairly true. It's, uh, um, 
did your parents have some <coughs> sort of Sorry. expectations of you? You know, you come from this mining town, but they're pretty well, <coughs> they're pretty well educated, mm -hmm. but they're seeing also, there's probably still a bit of this mindset of, I want my kid to do better than me and do better than people here and maybe leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be, you know, parents, they want the kids to do better and it can be sometimes really, you know, tough love and hard on their kids or, so, or for you, it was just, we, we just, you know, believe in you or they didn't even have to push you because maybe at 12, you just say, Hey, I want to manage the, <laughs> the so, stock portfolio. You so are pushing was, the parents. So it was the opposite. <laughs> it was the opposite for me. It was, um, I had parents who are, um, I had a strange kind of, um, school sort of pathway. I was, <coughs> I can be eternally grateful for my, um, for my elder sister who basically told me math at four well enough so that I basically I had no effort to make until the age of about 11. Then I had a bit of like personal crisis was like, oh shit, for the first time, I don't understand things immediately. So I thought, oh, it's not, I'm not sort of good, good enough. And then basically I had like six months or a year where I like had a bit of a bit of a bit of a gap until, you know, like sort of, um, quatrième basically until I was sort of 12, 13. And then it was easy again. But essentially I had school fairly easy because I have a good memory and I was excellent at math, for example. Did, did she, did your sister teach you math or were you the little kind of smart little brother who, when your, te uh, your sister is learning math with your parents or learning geography in the capital, you're there with your kind of like both ears and you not only understand at the same time, but also start answering before her. Cause that's what my sister, she's mm -hmm. two years older. I learned everything through her and I was actually faster than her. So my, my challenge would be to answer before her. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned a lot of things actually mm -hmm. much earlier. Was it the same for you? She was actually teaching. No, you stuff. Like, I mean, I don't remember all of it, but I know that. So she's three years older mm. and then she wanted to be a teacher at the time. And then basically like she would have me, no, she would be whatever five, six and and sit me down in the, we had a playroom, we had, we had a decent house at my parents. Uh, we had a playroom where basically she would just play the teacher and, you know, put me in front of the whiteboard and, <laughs> and I had to answer the questions. So, so, uh, I don't, it was so early that I don't exactly remember, but I remember it, you know, that, that, like math was pretty easy because I had done it before kind of went through, through the whole primary and secondary school system. But I think, I think that led me to maybe feel more more at ease and comfortable about, you know, trying more things. Um, there's another aspect where I'm a bit of like, we have big, a big family on, you know, both, you know, my father, father's got about seven siblings, uh, my mom, but two, but it's basically there's triplets. There's, there's a lot of cousins and I'm more in the younger range of cousins. So I think you, you also feel pulled forward because you, you interact with a, a lot of family, you know, family interactions and so on. And basically you get pulled forward. Because you deal with a lot of, you know, a lot of your cousins are a lot older, basically between three and seven, eight years older. Mm. And you have to catch up because they're just, uh, you know, you, you know, it feels like, uh, I think my, my mentality is that uh, at the time, and it's still the same, it's like, you, you, you're different, I always feel a bit different. So if you're different, you, you have to be at the top or you, you, because you, you know, you can't be in the middle. You can't be mid curve, essentially. <laughs> you have to be, so if you can't be mid curve, you have to be on the right side. <laughs> so, so, so I think I was very, I've always been very good at putting a ton of pressure on myself. So I didn't really, my, my parents didn't really need to, to fish too much. And I had a lot of guidance from like a series of like girlfriends and so on who I wasn't even going for like a prep hour, where, you know, I was more than able to go. Um, and basically just different people just listening and the different people guiding me, but actually sort of, you know, second degree to the family, but not really called to the family on like where to go next and what, what, what to do, uh, um, what to do best. Um, yeah, it's, so, um, I think I've actually gained from my parents being a bit lax mm -hmm. about what I would do and, um, um, cause it just helped, it gave me the habit of just teaching myself a lot of things. Like when somehow I was bored, I just taught myself how to juggle. I've done some calligraphy, some Latin calligraphy myself. <laughs> I started more languages after 
studying more languages after the age of 20 than before because I was I was a bit bored in business school essentially. Mm. Um, no, what, what did you study actually? Uh, economics. Economics. Yeah. So I mean business management, but with a kind of strong. A big part of it was math, mm -hmm. just to select people because. I, I did my bachelor in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and in Switzerland, we don't have this prepa thing. You go to high school, and you need to have the maximum grade is six, and if you get four out of six overall, mm -hmm. you pass, right? Mm -hmm. And whether you have four or six, you can go to university. It doesn't change anything, the, which is good. The problem of that is there is no selection at the entrance of the university, except for medicine, mm -hmm. right? Because it's too expensive to have too many doctors to... Mm -hmm to to educate and train, right? So we were, the first year we were at 1,000 starting. 1,000, so there is not enough. You need to arrive two hours before in the morning mm. and then you need to fight for like, you know, a seat. And sometimes you sit on the floor, sometimes you would sit outside of the auditorium so you wouldn't even wow. see or hear anything. Maybe you would hear because the professor would have a microphone, right? And so their way to select people because second year only 300 go, or 250. Mm -hmm. Math everywhere. They would just like put math everywhere mm -hmm. they could, even in places where math doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of econometrics and all that kind of stuff, which they used to select, right? So it was more on the technical side, which was interesting because you, it's kind of learning a new language, learning, you know, econometrics. Mm -hmm. There was all these signs and Greek alphabet and everything you do this thing. Like, oh, I'm so proud I did this development, but is it really useful? <laughs> like probably not. <laughs> Just a selection. You, you are in this mindset where you think amazing because you did these two or three pages of a uh, development of things that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. But I was always super critical. Yeah. I was like, I'm doing that. I take it as a challenge. I take everything as a challenge and I want it to be to have the best grades. Mm -hmm. So I would do whatever it takes to get the best, best grades, even in these, you know, classes that I really didn't like mm -hmm. just by ego. And also because I wanted to work for McKinsey and I knew you needed to have the best grades to work for McKinsey. Um, but deep inside, I was always like, nothing of this makes sense. None of this professor inspires me mm -hmm. because none of them worked before. And also I knew I wanted to start a business very mm -hmm. early on, uh, already in bachelor. And, um, I wanted to not do a master and to go straight at building a business. But my mm -hmm. father was telling me, no, 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 you're going to do a master because he did really well in life, but he, the last kind of like ultimate step of his career, he could never go in big corporate because he didn't have a master from okay. prestigious school. So I was like, Kevin, you're going to do a master so that in the worst case you have everything you need a new school yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. So I chose a one year master. Just, uh, I, it was three places, HEC Paris, London business school, and mm -hmm. then one in IE business school in Madrid. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. just like, I'm going to apply to the three of them because it's an 11 month master. So I can just like do this master as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and then start my first company. We talked about sport. Mm -hmm. You told me you were doing a lot of swimming. Yeah. Right. Professional swimming. Yeah, pretty much. But I also call, I also call this cheating because I was born on the 1st of Jan. So, 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 I mean, it's, it's a small way to be more, yeah, to sort of, uh, be, be, uh, more humble than I should be on that side. So it's, uh, I think it was really formative. So I'm very, just like you, I'm very competitive. Mm. And, uh, I think before, before going into the detail of formative and I have a yeah. of question. I wanted to talk about that five minutes ago, but I was like, I'm mm -hmm. not going to do it. But now that you mentioned, I wanted to ask you, when are you born? First of Jan. Mm -hmm. I'm born the 13th of Jan. Mm -hmm. And so for school, especially for sport, it makes a massive difference. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain why? So it's because you, you, you run into, or you compete in your year, but especially in years where you, you have the gross pass, I was basically, I think I gained about eight centimeters over the summer of my 12 years, uh, when I turned, you know, I was 12. So, um, I was basically 180 at 12 and, uh, and, and, and training and, trading stocks <laughs> and swimming from the age of four. So okay. basically, so basically, uh, I looked like an 18 year old. Uh, so it was just, it was just, and, and I remember seeing, um, and I was also, it shocked a few 
people in my in my school because I was a year earlier at school. So basically because I was from Jan, I could start earlier. But basically when you compete, you still compete with your year. <laughs> so people who didn't know in which class I was basically saw like this tall guy who was just running with them, for example, <laughs> or swimming with them. And uh, it, it, makes a, it makes a massive difference. So I still have, uh, at my parents, I don't, I don't have them here, but I still have basically a, a, a pile, a, a mountain of various medals from uh, from, from swimming and, and running and so on. From essentially from this skew of being born in like uh, Jan, like Jan or Feb or so. How, um, how much do you think this being born early when you like sport and you do a lot of sport, being born early impacts your self-confidence in a very positive fashion and th throughout your life afterwards. Yeah. So I think it was, it was really crucial. And like the one time, so I was saying like math was a good like anchor in terms of feeling confident and like, you know, problem solving and then just giving you, you know, something you know how to do. Like even at the time when I was uh, around 11, I had like a few things that I finally had to actually just go and digest and, and, and learn a bit deeper. And, um, so I had a bit of like more shaky confidence on the math side. I still had the, I still had the sports. So it just gives you, you know, and like, you want to have several legs. It's like, uh, it's like a business. You want to have several legs. Mm -hmm. It's like as, as a, as a personally, you want to have a few things that you can trust that you can, you know, you can, you know, maintain, have, you know, good, good self-esteem in general. Um, it gave me some bad habits as well. I've, I've realized later in life where it, it, that swimming makes me, it, there's, there's some of the good habits, which have been, um, so we were talking about, you know, being born in a mining town, which meant that we had a very decent, like swimming pool sort of facilities and so on, to be honest, uh, for, 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 for the size of the town and we had good trainers, but they were not really people I could compete with in the club, especially in my, in my, in my style. So it's more of a breaststroker and a backstroker. And then essentially, uh, there was another guy who was, uh, a freestyler who was, who was a, a French champion, but essentially I would swim in like lanes with like much older people. That's mm -hmm. what I ended up doing. But I came into the, the, the more, the conclusion that, um, thanks to swimming that I basically, uh, the biggest thing I could do is just work on myself and do the best I could do as opposed to comparing. And I still use this philosophy with, you know, competitors that we have today, you know, with Wintermute or so like, it's more about, you know, focusing on doing what we can do best. And you can kind of use competition as a guidance. So like we're on new businesses and so on, but then caring too much about competition is a bit of a distraction. So it's more about, you know, focusing on your own lane and focusing on generally what you can achieve by yourself. Why is it so important to not focus on the competition, whether you are competing in sport or whether you're building a company? Mm. I think it can be misguiding. It just, um, I think focusing on competition is, 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 is often, uh, one thing is it could be discouraging when you, it looks like competitors are big while they actually may not be genuine competitors. When, as soon as you scratch the surface, like most of people who think that, you know, they compete with us, they, they don't really have the same offering. Um, so I think that's one thing is like not, not sort of stopping for the wrong reasons too early. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, the legacy problems that, you know, typically, you know, considering Wintermute, there's, there's people who compete with us who come more from traditional finance and so on and have all sorts of legacy infrastructure and so on and things that help them and things that really, really don't help them, uh, especially in the crypto space. So, um, yeah, it's, it's. I think it's just good to look at the competition to get a bit of guidance on like, oh, maybe, maybe I should, you know, try this or try that. Mm. Um, but you know, it may not, you know, not be suitable to, you know, the culture, the organization and so on in, in general. So, and also uh, by focusing so much on other people, you are wasting so much energy that could be put to good use yeah. when they don't even necessarily care about you or even know you exist. So it's all a waste, complete, complete waste. Yeah. So you, you know, I've done quite a lot of, um, you know, web two and web three most startup investor, mm -hmm. uh, startup investing is you, you have a lot of people who sort of confess the uh, focus on competition too much. Mm -hmm. And my rule of thumb is like, well, unless you have like 10, 15, 20% market share, like, why do you care about competition? So what do you <laughs> think about the famous or infamous competition slide in, um, equity pitch deck. Oh, in the deck? Yeah. Cause 
a lot of people say, oh, you absolutely need to put this thing because it shows you know who is your competition. Mm -hmm. Or are you much more like practical down to earth saying, bro or sis, I don't give a fuck about like build something, <laughs> do something, and then you'll care later, right? I think you you, you should just build your own thing. And, and it, it, the, the, as you said, it can be a distraction. So, so two things. I think it is useful to have this sort of slice just to show that you know your market. I think it's more like mm -hmm. a knowledge, but it shouldn't be the focus. So you're aware of your competitors. So you go going back to the swimming, the the the, the, the swimming analogy. Like you you know that who else is you know jumping in the water with you. But to be honest, like most races are run like you don't you don't you have no idea where the others are. So you just there's there's so much you know foam going around and so on. You just focus on doing the best race you can. You don't you, you don't know you're just focusing on just you know uh, touching the wall first, and you know you have no idea uh, where, where the others are. So that's that's one was one comment, but it's also. I think it can be useful in a way that for, from the investor's perspective, it's, um, it's a different work. So basically when you're an entrepreneur, you, you focus very, very vertically, you try to, you, you're digging, you're digging, basically you're very, very, being very focused, but from the investor's point of view, it's useful to see the competition because you're trying to pick essentially a winner in the market. And then, mm -hmm. and then you also, it also, from, there's a second dimension where you, you're trying to pick, basically you're trying to get a gauge of like, oh, if these guys are successful and they grow, they can reach, you know, this competitor's scale slash valuation slash. Mm. So it's more, I think it's more from that perspective, but you know, it doesn't mean that you're showing, you know, the whole map of a country that, you know, that, that people should just, you know, dig like it shouldn't be focused essentially. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much, it's good for awareness. It's good to show knowledge, but it really shouldn't be the focus. I think it's, if, um, the, what the focus should be is, uh, talking to, you know, existing or future customers, um, picking the investors, right, picking the employees, right. So that these sort of things are so much more crucial than thinking of competitors. And in the swimming context, what would it look like to focus on yourself? Mm, yeah, like there would be, there would be really good trainers. Um, apart from relays, there's not a lot of like teamwork as such. Um, so it's more about, um, yeah, good. How do you alternate in a dry work? Basically, the the focus in the gym versus how much time you spend in the water, uh, food, and everything else, just like any other athlete. So it's probably much more similar to to sprinting, uh, you know, in athletics as such. In mm. terms of so the key benchmark is how much better am I doing today than yesterday or a month ago or six months ago? Yeah, and focusing on myself. Yeah, and if we apply this to life in general. Because today, it's extremely easy to, even if we don't want to, to compare ourselves with others, right? Mm -hmm. it could be in business, or it could be in sport, or it could be just in the life game, you know? Because we have social media where everybody's kind of addicted to social media. Mm -hmm. It could be on Twitter with, oh, this guy has a bigger PNL than me, or it could be on Instagram, oh, this, hot, this girl is hotter than me, or this guy has bigger abs than me, mm -hmm. you know? So, in the context of you saying how it's more important to focus on yourself than on other people. Why would you, why would you tell 25 years old Frank, how can he turn his attention and energy towards himself to maximize his chances of his chances of success in life when social media makes it so easy to compare, you know, himself to others and even be jealous of other people. What's yeah. the first step? I think it's, I think it's the general, I mean, to, to add more color to it, I think it's just it makes it very easy for people to pro procrastinate and just basically just, just, you know, just waste, <laughs> waste time and like, I should have done this, I should have done this. I think, um, I think, I think it's one, one, one a bit, I think it's, this, so this is less from trading, but it's uh, less from swimming, but more from trading as a learning is, um, to be a good trader, you have to be quite, I mean, nowadays it's, it's very algorithmic and so on, but, but, uh, when I started trading, uh, trading options, especially like it's things that are actually very difficult to, to automate. And essentially it's a lot about having a set of rules, so being ready, knowing what you will want, what sort of, you know, positions do you want to, you know, be long or short, I don't know, uh, uh, we can always 
can always define everything if when it's needed, but essentially, you know, benefit from things going up or down. Uh, you want to have a, you want to have a trading plan ahead of time, but also, you know, have certain set of limits and so on, just have a, have a trading plan, um, that you abide to. But beyond that, I think it's just, uh, um, it's more about building something reliable, um, than really thinking about, uh, something, you know, as reliable and as scalable as possible, as opposed to thinking of whatever someone else is doing as such, because then you always rely on whatever they're doing. And it's, it's very much the case in like on Twitter and so on, like it's very, like people are asking us for alpha and so on, on like the next big coin is that mm. we don't know. That's, that's not, it's not, it's not what we do. Um, I only know how to do two things. Well, it's like really short term, like just very much liquidity provision. So very, very, very statistical, very much like we get paid because we get pushed into a position that we don't necessarily want. Uh, and we just had to hedge it constantly just to, uh, as in hedging it as in not being, you know, not making money for, because things are going up or down as such mm -hmm. and very much so <clears throat> in building the most re reliable infrastructure, uh, to be there when, when things, you know, are, are more shaky. Um, and then the other things that we, we know how to do to well enough is just the really long term investing. So essentially access to good deals and then filtering just to make sure that you do, you know, have access to deals and, 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 and filter to, to pick the, the good deals in there. And that's essentially more, you know, startup slash, you know, foundation investing so that, that may take more like five, 10, 15 years to, to get there. Mm. Um, and that's more, more qualitative as such, but, um, yeah, it's, 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 I think the habits to get to is just, uh, being, uh, like a beginner's mindset is good in general. So just to go, go back to first principles and say, oh, you know, how, you know, if I'm learn whatever trading, like what, what are, what are the good basics to, to start with, um, and have a model, have some sort of model instead of, you know, um, if you don't have a model, you're basically gambling. Um, and, and once you have the model, it doesn't have to be good to start with, but at least you have something that you can measure and evaluate. And then, you know, and this, you know, um, tweak a few things and, 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 um, you know, learn from essentially you want to have, you know, as much, as, as much data as possible, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, people procrastinating <laughs> it's, it's it's very very bad habits uh because all that energy should just be spent in you know learning something or just bringing you into the right direction um especially when you said so it's not only the globalization is not only about the attention but it's also about the competition so basically so um when you build a company today there's a there's a few people saying this out there and i'm, and I'm one of them is a, is that it's never been as easy to become a billionaire, but it's never been as hard to become actually a millionaire because it's actually, it's just difficult to be somewhere in between. So you either build a company that does really well and that basically, you know, is, is one of a, one of a market leader as such, or like you basically try to be somewhere in the middle and then, and then, it, you know, you, 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 you can't get enough space for yourself in the market. So it's, um, like the competition is also, is also global. Mm. Um, but it's true. It's just, um, yeah, it's important to find your own, yeah, your own, your own niche as such. And, um, yeah, it's it, the, the, the wall for attention is, is quite, uh, I mean, I think that's why we have the habits of like putting phones to sleep mm. and, um, having focused conversations. Uh, that's, that's pretty good habit. I think, uh, I think being more tolerant, you're saying like with, with age, what, 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 what changes, I think I'm quite tolerant of like saying loads of things that I don't know um just being quite open about it and just always go to it's not about me knowing something but it's more mean often me more knowing some expert or someone who knows more mm -hmm. um uh and, I, and just um you know crowd, crowdsourcing things well enough um i think in that way and it's more like 25 year old you know the, the franking question hopefully knows already where his spikes are He's got like a few things where he thinks that, he, you know, he's better at, at one than, than some other people. And then just focus on that. I think just people trying to be like very, very much like generalists and so on. I don't think it really works. <laughs> I think, I think you're just better off, you know, focusing on your strength and, 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 and scaling that and then just, and finding other people to, to fill the gaps. So, uh, than really, uh, just being like too so much you're, So you're saying more depth than breadth, right? Yeah, so I, ideally, ideally you have two or three spikes where you're very good. 
Um, so let, I don't know. Like, do, do you want to go through the exercise? What, what would you be like? What, what you think that you you're much better than the average at? Like I said, there's, there's a few few domains. Selling myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think networking, biz dev, sales, hundred percent. Because I can get people in the zone when I start to talk, mm -hmm. and I've always been like that. When I was 21 years old, going to Hong Kong, ha having to sell myself to get to be the one getting a flat, mm -hmm. you know, or a room in a flat to, with a guy who was 45, he was like, "Man, I had you on the phone, and I knew it was going to be you." Mm -hmm. And it's a strength, and you should focus on that and do only that. Mm -hmm. You're amazing at selling yourself, and. I was the dude who had done all this math and all these things and struggled so much to go get good grades. And you're telling me I should sell. <laughs> I was like, fuck, man. So But I knew it. And with, with girls, it was the same, you know, like everything mm. at the end of the day, everything is kind of like sales in life. Yeah. Like the way you, you get you, investors or employees, like you, you need to sell them the fact that this is the place to work. Right. Mm. Or if you want to be with a girl or, um, I don't know if you're networking or making friends, the way you talk and a lot of people think sales is a um, manipulation. And I think it's absolutely not. The more you are honest and transparent mm -hmm. and real, the more people will like you. And yeah. if you're likable, they will want to do business with you or have a relationship with you yeah. or, or hang out with you. Right. So for me, it's definitely biz dev work sales, which is why this, this podcast and the other things we do around mm -hmm. and which is why my other business that I'm running since eight years, data analytics. I'm the guy who started it, get all the clients, mm -hmm. got all the teams together, and then I have a bunch of like very you know, engineers working on the projects and I'm running the business side, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that. And I, I accepted that despite having done all these good grades, I never used them to get a job. And I'm never gonna have to show the fact that I'm decent at technical stuff. But if I think about it, I'm definitely probably average or maybe not even at technical stuff because there's people like you or like other with so much or like all the people who work in my data analytics company mm -hmm. they're so good they're engineers you know like i'm like i can't compete with that it's impossible so but you don't you don't you don't need to <clears throat> i think what's good is you want to have just enough technical understanding to make sure you're not hiring the wrong person for example or you can have a dialogue So you want to be speaking the same language to a degree, but then, I mean, hiring, you should always hire smarter people anyway. So, um, you know, okay. yeah, on my side, it's been more, um, very good at the, 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 the math or the, 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 especially financial math. There was good overlap from the first jobs. Essentially it was math. It was, uh, it's very entrepreneurial as such, very, you know, very, very curious as a person that led me to be, you know, very much a language geek as well. So speaking, you know, much better English than most French people when I, when I started to work in Holland and then the relationships are similar to you, like the uh, relationship side is more, it's been more about re remembering everyone, well, they, when I've met them, <laughs> when, when I've met them to the point of being creepy and, you know, passing nearly as a stalker for some people were like, why do you remember this? Are you following me? Kind of, kind of thing. But it's just, uh, for me, it's just my way to show that I pay attention to people and try to trying to, trying to have, you know, real, real connection with people in life. What kind of example, like saying, oh, you remember something from a very long time ago, or, you know, something that they don't expect you to know. Or? Yeah. Because they, they still remember that, whatever, when the family members from my first boss in Amsterdam and you know, their, their names and stuff. And, uh, mm. so it's more, uh, <laughs> or, or you just scare people because you remember exactly why you met them six years ago and you haven't seen them for, for that's, for. that's incredibly useful in sales mm -hmm. But, or again. If you are talking to a girl and you remember what she told you, mm -hmm. she'd be like, oh, you're listening to me. I can't believe it. And I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. And in business, like you met a guy and it was not the right moment to do business. And a year and a half later, you have this second meeting that you've been chasing like crazy to have, obviously. Yeah. And then you remember these things from like a year and a half ago because you remember them, right? Yeah. And like, it makes a massive difference. Absolutely. And it's, it's more just creating, yeah, just to be as useful as possible for, you know, the rest of my team is more like having the scale. Mm -hmm. uh, now I meet so many people that it starts to find its limits, to be honest, <laughs> but, but it's more about, um, yeah, making interesting connections and so on and, and, and simply trying to, you know, so overlap these domains and just, you know, suggest 
so there's you know new businesses to, um you know to, to discussions with my co-founder and things like this just to just find uh find find cues on you know what to do next to what to do next and it's often just just having had these these conversations or so you talked um, you, you talked about um learning languages mm -hmm. you said before i was uh, studying business and yeah. i was bored right and i started to learn languages um and we also talked about the depth versus breadth yeah right so i know that you studied speak about 10 languages so i studied 10 i speak maybe five or six or so like co correctly yeah and you talked about music also yeah that you played or learned was, six <laughs> instruments six right instrument. yeah it was, so so some of them some of them are much deeper like saxophone i played played it for like eight nine years or so uh did six years of piano two years of guitar um i tried six i tried the violin for six months I was getting too frustrated with it. It's just, this is very difficult. So if you have a good enough ear, you just know that basically when you start playing the violin, that it's always, it's always off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, um, but it's more, I think it's about, um, this is the sort of pastime that I like to have. So nowadays it's more like learning more, more Korean as such. Um, but, um, yeah. And so, so to go back on the context, it was, Post, so when you get into business school in France, basically you, you go through a prep, the craft prep pass, basically more of a prep school before that, and you tend to be quite cramming. Um, you do, whatever well, we basically do like ER sort of hours, like, you know, 120 hours a week, basically of cramming. Mm -hmm. And then you end up in business school, which is great, like socially and so mm -hmm. on. And there's a lot of good clubs to go to. And, and but, um, but essentially it's like 20 hours of sort of school. Like, yeah, because uh, the, the difficulty was to get into the business school, exactly. not to pass the business school. Exactly. Right? And I was still in the years where you basically didn't really need to show up in class. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so they changed that the few, few years after me, but, um, <laughs> but basically you could just be like, no, no, no good to school and just spend time in like clubs and so on and do, do still quite well. Um, and, uh, and long story short, I was, I was feeling like a bit. Like it was more of an intellectual desert. I did learn quite useful things uh, in, in business school as well, but, um, but I started learning more like Italian at the time. And then, um, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, with my first job, I moved to Holland mm. and then, um, whatever I learned, uh, Japanese 2004 or so. So I started in 2004 and then ended up learning some more Chinese. And then, so I, I did, I did more of the difficult ones already. So, and it's more the past time, I think. I think there's like a whole podcast that you can dedicate <laughs> to language learning. <laughs> Just a question on that. How much is learning a new language the same as or similar as learning a new instrument? Um, we had Alex Vanevik on the podcast. It's a very good similar thing. So I consider music as a language. Math as exactly. well. Exactly. So I consider like if you tell me, oh, like say for you kids or whatever, like who should, what should, what, what languages should you learn? So whatever, English, French, and so on, and also math and music. I normally put this as languages. So it's true that I think it depends on how far the instruments are from each other, but it's similar to languages in the way that you can have languages close to each other, let's say like, you know, German, English, or so on, like, or French and French and Spanish and Italian and so on, like group of languages as if you were playing like sax, you know, alto and sax tenor and so on, like it's very, very, very similar. Um, it's probably easier to learn several instruments than it is to learn several languages. Mm. Um, but what I like with the, the language learning is that it usually gives you like 50% of the culture is essentially in the language, the way people talk to each other, the way, you know, if there's, you know, polite, there's a certain degree of politeness or not. So same thing in French or like Korean have two different levels. There's three levels in, in Japanese. There's two levels in Chinese, but to be honest, like there's only one level that's really, really used. And then you, you get a lot of the subtlety of like, culture of people with like through, through, uh, through, through language learning. What can be often difficult is that you need to get to at least sort of a, you know, an intermediary level where you can at least, you know, watch a few movies and so on to, to be able to maintain it. So some of these are, you know, I don't have the time to maintain them, but, but for the Asian languages, I try to try to maintain them quite, uh, quite carefully, especially since I moved here. We had, uh, Alex Van Evik on the podcast and he speaks six languages also and we were talking about music and languages and how basically it's 
patterns. It's like math. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to math. You have patterns. And once you understand the key patterns, like the chords of a song, you can play the song. And once you understand how the language is structured, you can, it's much easier to learn and kind of articulate it. How is learning a new language or a new instrument the same as building a new company? Mm. <laughs> In terms, and I'm thinking here about, again, this pattern recognition. And when you're building this company, you are, at the end of the day, for me, it's more, there is a process to everything, right? Mm -hmm. You want to build wealth, investing, there's a process to it. Mm -hmm. And once you understand it and you apply it, usually it works, right? If you want to grow social media, there is a process to it. If you want to learn a language, there's a process to it. If you want to build a company, Obviously, it depends the industries, but there is always a kind of like playbook or process that's more likely to work, right? Yeah. Yeah. Investing is very structured. Company building can be very structured, but sometimes you get like true disruptions can, can be like quite, quite surprising. Like you've got good examples there where, um, you know, what three words, do you know the company? What, what three words? I think, I think no. it's, it was originally British, but, um, um, it's basically people who don't know anything about maps who just decided that the, the addressing system was like very, very badly set up anywhere in the world. And then they decided that they would just define these new squares of like three meters by three meters across the, across the globe. And they give three words to define the location. So you can give a, a rendezvous point to someone in the middle of the desert now for deliveries for everything and so on. So it, it became, I don't know to what extent it's more of a public good to be honest, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's people who just didn't really know about, you know, mapping and uh, addressing as such, um, and, and came up, you know, you know, pretty interesting solution to, to a problem. So I think, I think there's a degree where you should avoid being an expert in company building because mm. a lot of people, a lot of the experts, like a lot of smart people tend to uh, find all sorts of reasons not to do things. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, with the with, with the podcast we did with my co-founder last week, we were basically like, he was like, be delusional, like basically don't underestimate yourself and so on. So be, be very ambitious. I think, I think it's very, it's fairly true. I think it's really good to be very ambitious in company building in the way that target things that are, that are, you know, quite big and, and, um, and just try and get feedback and you need to find that you need to walk this fine line. So if you're talking about process as such, um, at least the philosophy of it, it should be like walking this fine line away. You need to be assertive enough with your choices that you could, you need to make real bets, real choices in, you know, how you're building the company and what, you know, who your first customers are, what your first product is and so on. But you should also be, uh, you know, being able to listen enough to like, you know, customers feedback or people, people, you, you know, some investors may be noisy, but some investors may have very useful feedback for you. So you need to be able to filter through, through that noise. And that's not, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, there's a lot of network effects in, in company building in the way that I think it's probably explains well. So, um, that's my fourth venture. My first venture did fairly well, and but it was also with two ex colleagues from Optiversa, that, um, the, the, the trading firm from, from Holland I, I worked for when I was 23 to 27. So just. Uh, after uni, you went to Holland, yeah. worked in a trading firm. Exactly. And then started your own, your first company. Um, yeah. So I spent four years over there and I had to, to sit for like a year and non-compete and then started my first company. Which was? Uh, which was essentially a trading firm at a family office, uh, more like macro hedge fund and a family office, trading, trading rates and more complex stuff, more like, more listening to central bankers and thinking of how that would impact the prices and then taking positions, taking, taking bets essentially on, um, and then we, um, we started 2011, so we said we had the tsunami, we had a Greek vote, we had a Greek crisis and so on, basically in whole in 2011, and we did pretty well. Like we returned about 162% or so in that, in that first year, mm. um, with essentially a structure that was just being built. Um, so, you know, that was a success to, to a degree. And then but a lot, the entrepreneurial journey for that, for that company was a bit frustrating for me because we, I was there to build a firm. And then basically the investors were just more or less like just there to allocate funds. So we like, I ended up you know, three, three years later, I ended up just, just taking my shares and then just, you know, doing something else. Um, why exactly? Why? If you have to explain it in a simpler fashion, because I know the fashion, story, but what was the 
main problem of this first business despite making great money? So it had one leg instead of having several legs. So basically it was a bit too cyclical. So what we were doing is we were essentially um, taking, so taking bets on like a few dislocations in the market. So we needed some big funds to, to push the prices around fast to show, to basically to, to resurface, to give us some opportunities to trade. Um, these things happened obviously around, you know, 2011, there was a lot going on a bit, bit early in 2012. But then towards the end of 2012, um, you probably remember it was basically not so such a negative interest rates. Um, and then it's, and it got pretty, pretty static and pretty boring as such. So a lot of the big funds, a lot of people who would normally put large bets and, you know, shift things around in interest rates got, you know, just basically they, 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 they had no reason to, to go and be, you know, a trading activity there. And, um, and at that time, I just wanted to, uh, the, the, the route for us was to, you know, ex extend to uh, other asset classes and, and essentially we, essentially our investors. So we had, we quite stuck with a few backers and these backers, but they were diversified. We were not, and basically didn't really want us to compete with all the groups that they had invested in. So we ended up, you know, deciding to just go, go separate ways, but I took a, that took, um, another year and a half, you know, two years to really just you know, negotiate everything out. So, uh, um, this is why, you know, choosing your investors wisely is, 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 so is the key pretty poem was the investors didn't have the same view or long-term view as you guys, mm -hmm. the, the, the entrepreneurs. Yeah. There was, uh, an element of conflict where they were invested in, in people who, who were already trading the assets that we wanted to trade. That's one, one aspect. And the other problem was that that's why I'm, Insisted. I mean, that's why Wintermead is structured the, the way it's structured is on with VCs and not like fund allocators and so on. And, and uh, so initially we, we got, you know, four, we did four VC rounds as such, and it's very much to have long-term investments. So you want to, you want to, people who, who, who bet in you for the long term, it don't ask you every day, you know, exactly all, um, you know, how much have you made today? And, and, you know, which is much more akin to a fund mm. and we didn't want to fall into that trap. Um, so these two aspects, so short term, long term, and then the, the aspect of like, more the, the conflict on that, um, what I said, you know, what I said, can you cover? And then you said a second company. The second company was more on the venture studio side. Um, so I was already quite actively investing in, in the B2B side. So I had some, some, some exit basically from the first company still. Um, and I was more as a, you know, entrepreneur investor, I was advising a few teams. So I think I was on up to 14 balls at that, at that time. Uh, what age? I was 31. Okay. Yeah. So I had a lot of people, it's an interesting question because I had a lot of people on balls who were 70 or 80 and who looked at me on the first ball meeting was like, what is, what is he doing here? And then, and then around the second meetings, it would flip usually because I had often, sadly, I had more expertise and so on than, than them. And in either the space or, or not as a, I could help the team more, um, just because I was much more, much more active and I, and I, and I had been there as, as an entrepreneur, but, um, yeah, it was an interesting, interesting journey as such. So 14 uh, boards, but board. Yeah. So you wanted to start another company. So I Venture used to call studio. it, do you want to explain yeah, what it is? Yeah. So that was, um, so there's a, the 14, but it's more like investing or angel investing. I, 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 I would call this more entrepreneurship as proxy. So you, you bet into the people to build whatever company as such. And then it balls like when you're in a, when you invest in a, an early stage startup as such, um, even once a month can be like the business may have changed dramatically within a month mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily know about it. And it's sort of like, you just play catch up once mm -hmm. a month and it's just, it's, it can be a pretty frustrating exercise. Um, but it's quite, it's been quite an interesting learning in terms of, um, yeah, getting more scope in terms of different industries and different, it, it, it was quite centered around sort of more web two B2B SaaS, so software as a service as such, because then I could help actually a you know, good, good enough network at the time. So I could help commercially these different teams to, to, to sell and, or try some, you know, proof of concept and so on at the time. Um. And it's the question of like, it was more a phase of exploration for me and then just learning a bit more around, you know, structuring around and so on. Um, also set up another business at the time that essentially was doing cross-border, uh, deal, deal broking between essentially the UK and China. 
why it was still, you know, easy, not too difficult to do. Uh, so around the Internet of Things or so, around some, you know, chips and so on. Um, and there's a market actually for individuals or small firms, or boutiques sort of M&A, under $100 million deals. So the Lazan and so on, the, 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 the big banks, the, the, the investment banks, they actually tend to do deals above 100 or maybe above like half a, half a billion. And they don't really, they don't really help teams, you know, under a hundred million dollars. So you can, you can make a living out of this. So all of this merged into more, more of Wintermute at the end. Um, so just the venture studio. Yeah. This was the investing in these 14 businesses or you were, no, that was me. Right? That was, that was, that was myself. So okay, I invested so what in did about you do with the venture studio? The venture studio um, turned into more of a um, like a workforce platform. Now uh, there is another you know, more an investor to a team that uh, uh, helped more as a, an advisor investor, but uh, another team that turned into more of an AI, uh, whatever competitor of Palinty in the UK as such. Mm. Uh, Some more data data science uh, platform or data science as a, a infrastructure, if you want. Um, or Usually the good venture studios turn into it. They just build a certain knowledge base and then they turn into their own product. Mm. Um, and um, what was the problem with this business? The problem with this business was that there's a, f um, especially the vent of venture studio side, there's two, two sides of it. There's a, there's a side that's more, that pays the bills. That's more like digital agency type of things. So consulting, um, type consulting of and so on. And you can build up, you know, businesses like this, like to a few million, maybe like early eight figures or so in revenues, you have like a fairly static sort of 50 ish percent margin and so on. If you do a good work, you, 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 you'll get there. Mm. It doesn't scale that far. So usually you, you end up with doing like the venture studio side, you end up spinning off products and so on. The really the big challenges about venture studio is that even if you can spin off good products, it doesn't necessarily turn into its own startup over time. You need to find, you know, CEOs, you need to find like a team that, that takes it over. And that's why I explored quite a lot across the space, especially in the UK, but you know, there's, there's other models like the entrepreneurs first model or, or Antler that, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. So became, you know, full disclosure, I became a, an LP in Antler, I think 2017, 18 or so, um, because of this, because they, they, I thought they were treating that problem better than others, uh, by you matching became an LP in, in, in Antler, in Antler. Yeah. Wow. Because 2017. they match, okay. yeah, because they match, you know, they match, um, um, they match founders as such and in a different way. So they just go earlier stage. Yeah. Um, but the venture studio model, I think there's I'm still a bit on, on the side in terms of, um, I think, I think it can work, but it's just very difficult to, to, to make it work. I mean, rocket internet is, is a big example of how to make it work, but it's just, I think it's maybe more the exception than the, than the rule. Um, anyhow, yeah. it gave me, gave me a bit of a platform in, in terms of, um, yeah, just a, just another interaction with you know the teams I had invested in, and then um, it's more through uh, through uh, more me going back to trading in 2016 that I uh, uh, came across you know ICO essentially early 2017, and then you know um, joined essentially uh, you know co-founded Wintermute at the you know very end um, you know 2017 essentially. So how did the lessons of the previous businesses help you build um, intermute to the next level from the first business it was essentially choose your 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 investors very wisely um choose um there's a not so a more an internal aspect of like the co-founders from my first business they were they were good but they were less probably less entrepreneurial and they're, they're very focused on they were more juniors to me and that wasn't necessarily a good thing. So I felt that I had not necessarily learned enough over this three, four years, and like from a training perspective. Mm. So there's learning as an entrepreneur, but there's also learning as a, if you, if you run a trading firm, so there's also learning as a trader. And then you want to have, you want to be ahead of the curve, or at least you want to learn as fast as your competition to at least, you know, maintain a certain, whatever, a certain knowledge level. And so you don't, you don't want to lose ground there. And it may mean that, uh, maybe like understanding these central bankers better, uh, maybe it's better modeling and so on, maybe it's better infrastructure, but it, it, you need to have, you need, you need to maintain at least a, a certain edge there. And I, and I felt that it wasn't, 
the case really uh, uh, after the first the first, the first ventures. That was that was also a key element to get. Um, so that interesting aspect is that essentially, so I took a founders who went to me. So um, Yevgeny is essentially as senior as me. So he's, he's a year on, is a year was four four months younger than me. How um, old are you? I'm forty now. And um, but he had spent basically a decade at, at Optiver. Um, Just a parenthesis here. Yeah, this is the exact age that most studies show. Yeah, the average successful founder is right. Whereas when you start, when you go to university, you think, oh man, uh, entrepreneurship is the way. I need to start a company in my twenties, like Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's kind of it's less sexy of a story. But most of the successful founders are forty years old. They're not. 22 yeah. or 29. Yeah. So I think, I think there's a bit of a, a mention that touched on that earlier, but it's about a network effect. Essentially, I think you, you get, um, you probably know, and it's especially through, through my investing experience in between, you probably, you, you know, what questions to answer, but even with that, it's more about, um, I, mean, I was still told a lot of no's when I was starting to raise for money from Wintermere because when we when we all um, essentially I had some funds allocated to me to trade crypto on my side, and then basically I was like, okay, I need to find another trader and like a CTO or like a senior dev because I'm really not the best coder. So we're talking about also about knowing where your spikes are. Mm -hmm. I perfectly knew that my spike wasn't coding, so like I really needed someone to help there. And also, if you think of markets being 24 seven, um, some people you want to, regardless if you want to take holidays or not, like you need someone can be, can, can be sick or so, so you need some, at least another trader, you know, you need to be you, helpful, you know, <laughs> it can be sometimes helpful. and to take a day off <laughs> exactly. once a year. <laughs> exactly. Even if you don't want to, you should have it. It's yeah. just not, it's just yeah. not a good way to build a business if you don't have at least two persons who can trade. So, but so winter Muse started as you, it saying, started as I want to trade and I need to have someone. So it started as independently, it started as, as Yevgeny set up the company on the 25th of July, 2017. He was basically trading his own, his own account on Kraken mm. and he had a few algos running and he had a, essentially Haro at the time helping with the, the, the infrastructure, essentially the skeleton of the first, very first code, or like something called, like something running on like a Raspberry Pi. And then basically I had on my side, I had an allocation from a, a macro hedge fund like who wanted me to trade a crypto, crypto mm. sleeve, a part of the fund that, that would basically cover crypto. And I was like, okay, I have this, but I'm not, you know, I need other people to tell me. And then it's just a, whatever you can call it, a, 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 a match made in, in heaven or such. But it was through an ex-colleague, so from that trading firm from Holland, um, I just, you know, crossroads. I think people, that another thing that that's really important for entrepreneurs who want to be entrepreneurs is that it's just good to share information, crowdsource things, and uh, share ideas and so on all the time. And I and I shared I shared that problem with an ex-colleague who was actually in Boston. French guy in Boston who tells me, oh, you've you just moved to London. You should go and sit down with him and so on. And I thought it would be more to co-invest with you again, to be honest, at the time. I didn't know that he was- You know each other. Well, we knew each other from having worked together in Holland. You worked together still yeah, with Yeah, in 2007, okay. 2010 or so, but, but we are not in the same teams at all. So sort of knew each other from afar. Mm -hmm. So we had worked from the, for the same company, but we knew each other from, from afar. And essentially what, what ended up happening is that, um, I ended up, you know, coming in with more the, the fundraising experience and just taking them, taking essentially, you know, a very good team out of the garage, essentially. Mm. Um, and, uh, and something else that I really, really learned from, from previous companies. And I, and I had, I had like, I was feeling like I was talking to some, you know, deaf people basically. And, and, and you know, um, after my first trading firm, I tried to interview for like larger, larger trading firms. And I thought, okay, I, you know, in that, in that, uh, um, impetus and willing to just learn more things. I was thinking, oh, let's go for like, let's join and like build like a new, a new business for, let's say 40, 50 people, uh, you know, trading firm. And then, um, I was just trying to explain that the, what I thought was the main differentiation, even for a trading business was culture, mm. you know, how people are, you know, incentivized, how they line, how they incentivize to share knowledge and so on. And then, uh, so we were quite aligned on this very, very point with, uh, with Evgeny. Uh, so it was a really, really, really good thing. And then, um, yeah, we, we, we put, we put all the paperwork together, essentially very early 2018. I think it's just, I think that for the time for everything to be signed and papered, it was probably like Jan 2018. Um, and then it, 
and it was just around the time that the market was actually turning. Yes. So we had this, we had the spike at 20k and it yeah. basically was turning. And then I spent, I had commitments from a, essentially a good friend of mine and like in March for like half of the, the seed round, sound of like seed, seed A. And then he insisted for good reasons, he wanted the other half to be filled. And I was like, we'd, <laughs> so I was running around London and basically all my network was, was very good on paper, but my network was a network of like hedge funds and family physics and so on, and people who were essentially completely allergic to crypto at the time. And, and I ended up finding, uh, finding actually a good ground in people who were more from my, you know, more the startup side of my life. So the startup investing and so on. So co-investors in various, in various startups and so on. Um, people who are like more, 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 um, yeah, more, more happy to just take risk uh, at your stage and so on. Mm. And, and, um, and that was, that was good. And I was you know, very much in the line of the, the learning from, especially from the first business of picking, you know, aligned long-term investors, people who are just ready to just, you know, see, see, really see this as a VC investment. So like, you know, if it works, it's great, but if it doesn't work, they were ready to lose all their money. Mm. And, and it was super useful because it meant that we were able to really focus on building first, uh, to the point that we only really started to trade more actively in mid 2019. So essentially it's a, the first 500 K of, you know, trading loan that we, that we borrowed was a uh, 6th of August, 2019. So you imagine like basically there's about two years of building before we really started to, to, to trade more. And it also just gave us the opportunity to do more things in DeFi in 2019 or so, mm -hmm. uh, that led to some, you know, investment opportunities, uh, typically, typically DYDX. So, you know, I think it's important to, to, to really, to really think of, yeah, so this alignment of interest between investors and uh, picking your investors. And also uh, we got lucky and, and, and good in terms of picking the first employees as well, in terms of entrepreneurial people there. And then we also saw some of the employees who were very good at the start. And then some of the, some of the ones who were very good at the start were not actually not that good as we scaled. Yeah. And it was interesting that's... to manage like people's sensitivities who kind of wanted to run their own little team inside the company as we scale. And then you just, you know, some. How do you manage that? Because it's true. That's one of the key problems of companies that scale. You can have, even in the co-founders, actually, mm -hmm. it can happen. You can have amazing co-founders to start or key people to start, but mm -hmm. to go from one to 10 people, one to 50, but then they're just not, they just don't fit the job anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably like even my role just changed a lot over time. So yeah, but, was... yeah, but you are able to adapt, whereas some people are not able to adapt True. and need to be changed. I mean, that's why we, we bought, we bought the first CTO out. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that's, do you want to talk about that? No, but well, I, I don't know how much is going on. No, but don't it was, it was it. fairly cordial to be honest. It was just, um, uh, I, I think, I think we were, Yukini and I were just ready to be, you know, full, full fledged workaholics on this as, as we still are. And then just, uh, see ourselves and, and leave through the company as such. And it, and it wasn't his case. So it was just, uh, I think he got, but I think everyone was pretty, ha pretty happy with the deal he and got. And he was a co-founder. Yeah, he was the first. But he was also able to be self-aware and say, actually, I'm True. not going to, that's super important. Actually, I don't want to kill myself over this business. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not my mood. Therefore, let's find a deal or something that we can do and move forward. Yeah, I had insisted because I had experience of managing through a lot of my investments, have, having seen difficult like co-founders splits and like, uh, you know, uh, you know, companies that are not that mature, uh, maybe have raised a few round and then basically just, you know, managing this sort of separation. So I had said everything in terms mm. of vesting and so on. That was quite clear about how, how the vesting worked. So, mm. um, that was, that, that was, that was useful. Uh, it was also useful for me to change, change my role over time as well. So it's, um, but I think it's, I think it's quite, I think it's quite key to understand that. I think there's, there's the first phases where you have like the value creators and then you have the more, the optimizers later. Mm. So people who are much more like very good at, you know, implementing you know, very good operators but not, you know, not very good, you know, uh, value, value creators. So you, you need to, to manage the, the pace. I think it's also key to, um, you're talking about the, the more playbook on, on entrepreneurship is that, um, I think the first 10 to the, definitely the first 10, but I'd say up to the first 20 employees completely define your, your, your culture. So, um, and I think for a very long time, I'm pretty sure it's still the case, but like for a very long time, like cultural fit is the big, <laughs> it's the big part of like. Who do we hire? Who do who do we not hire? Um, we also made a decision of keeping the team small. So we have, you know, competitors have like three, four, 500 people, and we still under a hundred. 
Um, and it's more about, you know, managing people's effort at the result. But, uh, but I think it's easier to keep like a, a more consistent culture there. And part of this culture is going to the office, working together, seeing each other. Yeah. And not being just one person somewhere, one person, in another place. Yeah. Being so, connected, basically. Yeah. Mentally connected on the, the vibe and the mission. And you have this iteration or reiteration every day on why people are here, right? Mm -hmm. Versus everybody doing their things on their side and maybe doing amazing work, but that's not aligned. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially, I think there's a few rare cases where you, you can afford to be more decentralized when, uh, especially more the, the BD roles and so on, you should come back to base often enough, but you, you, you can afford to, you know, you should be outside essentially. That's what yeah, but, but you're not, that's the, that's the key thing. You yeah. should be out. You're not home behind mm. the laptop. Mm. Either you're in the office with people True. or you're outside meeting clients, True. investors. So basically you are not at home. You are not doing the, the definition, classic definition of remote work is I'm basically chilling at home or I can work from Bali, right? Or I can work from anywhere. Mm. It's okay. But actually no, either like you're part of the core team, either you are in the trenches literally and like meeting people all day long and you and the key discussion with people who might say i want to work remotely uh, because it's better might be okay do you want to be in the trenches every day and like wake up and do a million meetings mm -hmm. and like it's very tiring right or do you prefer to be in the office with the team and part of the culture there's that's true there's also a, a dimension of let's say what can be you want to be as efficient as possible. So you want to, you know, you want to focus on what problems you want to solve and you can solve and, you know, you know, you know and you just want to ignore the small problems as such, or especially mm -hmm. if you're part of management, basically the small problems should have been solved by other people first. Mm -hmm. Um, but and in part of this working remotely is that the temptation is just to text people, just like to, to be messaging people on Slack and so on. Like at least a phone call is so much faster and easier. <laughs> And then, Absolutely. and then meeting, like if you're in the same office, just like really just walking to someone's desk, it's just so much simpler. Um, and, and it avoids a lot of misunderstandings. Yeah. So it's you just... can actually save a week mm -hmm. by talking for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So I tend to, <laughs> tend to, tend to do, yeah, even whenever I need, I'll just do like calls and just, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just, fast. if I have to type more than sort of four or five cents, unless it's more like you know, uh, something, you know, contractual, uh, something that has to be written down because mm. there's a certain level of complexity. Okay. Then maybe, maybe you should put it on paper, but apart from this, like if it takes more than two, three sentences, if it, if it needs an email or something like this, usually just like a quick phone call is much faster. But people love to, I remember you showing me that you had like 80,000 unread emails. So people <laughs> still love to text you, right? <laughs> I love to text. I do. People you love to text you and see if you answer. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, sales pitches in there that are not, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's a public service announcement that I make regularly. I just take a screenshot of how many, how many emails. That Sorry start. guys, <laughs> I it's can't like, answer. It doesn't work. Crazy. No. What, what is Wintermute today? Um, it, as numbers, as a. I'd say, what do you guys do? Cause you said we started, we we're basically two guys trading yeah. some money. What do you guys do today? And what are some key numbers so we, that can help the audience understand how successful the business has become? So we do, we do three things essentially. So we, we like the, the key part, the core part of the business is we, the, the largest spot crypto market maker. So we cover, you know, between winter and summer cover between 250 to 350 tokens, uh, across 80 venues. And then we, ha we have about 15, so one, 5% market share. And then like the target for this sort of business is not hundred percent market share, it's more 20, 25%. So, you know, there's not a, a ton of space to grow, uh, there or just grow with the space on the, on the spot side. We're growing the derivatives business from Singapore. Um, and that means more TC. So TC is, you know, over the counters and, and trading more bilaterally. So it's a big part of what we, so to what, a, a year and a half, two years ago or so. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have now more than a thousand counterparties. So we, it's not only that us trading on the screen or on chain, as in on the screen is just sort of trading C C5, uh, or on chain. We also trade, you know, over, you know, telegram groups and slash on the phone. Um, we also have API, so we have robo advisors and some more fintechs of the world that they can plug into us for liquidity as well through, through API. So there's a bit of 
I mean, it's always, it's always very B2B, like even people who trade OTC with us tend to be at least high to ultra high net worth. And it goes up to the $50 billion hedge fund that has maybe, you know, half a billion to a billion deployed in crypto. Um, and, uh, we also invest, so we have about a hundred million dollars deployed across a hundred teams. Mm. It's purely from the balance sheet. There's no LP money. There's no external investors money. Um, so it's very much, it's very much started as purely a strategic investment. And then we try to, you know, so, so the, like we have to make some return on this. Mm. Um, so we, you know, we, 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 we set it up as a different, you know, uh, venture vehicle as such, and we, we have someone else, uh, you know, managing it now. So we still, you know, there's still a lot of synergies between the, the core business and, and the investment side, but it's, it's more and more financially driven as such. And then the third, uh, third or fourth dimension of the business is essentially we start to do venture building. Um, so we've got Bebop out there. Uh, so the CEO of Bebop is essentially an ex head of product of, of ours. Um, we have Wildcat now that's out there with Lawrence and so on. So, you know, a, a, a little Twitter personality as such in, in, in his own. Um, and we'll have more, more, you know, more, more, more projects as such that that will, um, you know, either incubate or we invest in as such that will be a bit, a bit closer to the business, or at least that we can, we can, we can help in that earlier stage. Um, and um, that's, that's about it for now. Like we, we announced that we, we started to trade, we, we started to trade on the CME not too long ago. Yeah, so it's that. funny, funny to see that we finally go back to TradFi. I was mm -hmm. quite happy to see it because CME is pretty much the first market I ever traded in. I mean, not. Not, not as an individual, but more as you know, professional trader. Um, so it's quite, quite you know, interesting to go back to the source as such. Um, and yeah, we just we're there to be the good agents in the space. We just hate anything that revolves around market manipulation and so on. Which I think Evgeny still has an article out there from 2018 about the good and bad and the ugly of the space. Mm. And then we just try to you know, just do our best to uh, to be the, to be the good agent and to be there quite quite aligned long term with the uh, with the rest of the ecosystem. So. Um, that's more or less where we are. Which is one of the reasons you're still alive today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But actors, probably most of them, probably not all of them, but most of them were punished pretty severely last year. Yeah. Flushed out of the system. So you built, you had a bunch of side projects and you built four companies, right? Yeah. And you said, essentially, at the first one was worked well, but there was this problem of alignment with investors. The next two were good to pay the bills, but not good enough to actually make it big. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one, basically Wintermoot became really huge. How do you go from a business that pays the bill, the bills mm -hmm. to a mega profitable and scalable business? What's the mind mindset shift? Mm -hmm. Cause probably a lot of entrepreneurs will stop at the first one. And there is a temptation to stop there because you spend so much of your own time into this that you're like, oh, yeah. I, I need to leave this thing that's working, that pays the bills, that might be a good cash cow to do something that I have no idea if it's yeah. going to work, right? So, so I still have co-founders on the venture studio side mm -hmm. who are still operating the business, essentially. So you're completely right. So it's about, uh, so if you see, like, whatever, give shares away in between and so on, but uh, you, you find alignment there. But essentially, yeah, you have to make a choice on like once, you know, you, you go through every time you build a company, essentially you go through a certain amount of experimentation. And then if it doesn't, doesn't fit the bill, um, then you, you need to, to do something else. And if you can't do something else as a team, then you just need to leave. And, um, but I think one framework I like to use and I find cheesy, I think is just, I think I mentioned it to you. I think it's, um, it's from this, uh, sales, uh, you guys saying, uh, Corleone, Cordone, Cordone. I never had a ah, uh, Grand Cardone. Grand, Grand Cardone. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that are just quite cheesy and like in his videos and so on. But if there's one thing to remember, it's actually the, the thinking 10x. So if you think of your current business, um, and then how do you scale it 10x? How do you, how do you multiply 10X. revenues to 10x and so on? And a really good thing with this, in like the intellectual exercise is that you just have to think of like, you know, can I, with the current business model, with the current like customer base and so on, can I scale 10x? Or do I need to transform something? And if you apply it to like a business like Wintermoon, it's more, okay, it was, there was, there was like a very conscious exercise in automating everything, but essentially it could be one of these things like moving from, let's say people trading manually to, to you know, full automation. And how do you get there? Um, and 
you know, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting, you know, exercise to, to go through. And then maybe, maybe it means that maybe the answer is that the market you're addressing is too small. Mm. Um, and then you need to, you need to, you know, you could use, maybe you can pivot a bit your offering and then you, 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 you target different customers. Um, but I think it's a really, really useful exercise to go through. I think it's often really good to focus on a niche that you can dominate. Um, and, uh, I think it's useful to have some experience. I think you, there's, there's, uh, you mentioned the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the fact that a lot of more successful, um, entrepreneurs are more like the, the, the venture that becomes successful, they started more when they was 35 or so, mm -hmm. um, which is the case, case for me, I was, I was essentially 34. Um, I was 34, Evgeny was 33. So, you, and, and I think it's the maturity of like people, you know, like you can, you can cover enough things in terms of, you know, recruitment, in terms of capital aggregation. So the, the, the money you need to raise from VCs and the, and the likes. And then also I think you have enough experience to not make too many mistakes. Mm -hmm. But even with this, I think it took us, um, Evgeny was saying that the other day, like there's a few tweaks that we were doing on the trading side until the end of 2019 that it still wasn't clicking. Things that we had tried in summer 2019 that wasn't necessarily working and it started to work like, very late 19, early 2020 with, with essentially with a, a bit more volatility. Uh, and then we started to see that, oh, that we've got good market fit there. So that was more like the technical market fit. Um, and it's started to just, you know, uh, like after on the back of that, we raised the series A and the series B. Um, so essentially March to June, 2020, and then basically the series B was essentially closed at, at the end of 2020. Mm. Uh, but it's also a commercial, more of a commercial aspect, a commercial uh, tipping point as such, or commercial product market fit. Um, that was more about um, us, you know, being quite aligned and being quite honest with, you know, many, many foundations and helping them with market making or, and essentially signing about 160 deals over 2021 on the, on the, on the back of this. So it's, it's often more than one thing. So, um, so, so scaling the 10X has been, you know, having the right infrastructure with the right culture, with the right team, um, and then right market conditions and to a certain degree, uh, sort of, mm. you know, with the, 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 uh, the back of 2020, 2021, essentially. And, uh, and during the winter to be actually <laughs> continuously more and more, because we've gained market share over the last two years as well. Um, for good and bad reasons for, for, for bad reasons in the way that we lost some competitors, we lost some competitors, mm. uh, for good reasons in the way that we, we continue to generally build in the space, uh, um, to, you know, I think who, who was telling me this, uh, uh, may have been you, uh, there's a, there's a cyclist, uh, analogy uh, to this and between the, between the, the, the summer sort of, um, if you're trying to go faster on the way down. It's kind of easy, but you, you maybe like save like a meter or two basically on your competitors. But if you can go faster on the way up, you may actually save minutes and minutes, you know, ahead of your competitors in, in cycling. I don't do much cycling, but so I'm just, I'm, I'm, uh, I've told the person that I would put him on there. And, uh, and I, and I like that because it means, okay, on the way up, let's assume that this is winter and then you can actually push, you know, when it's more difficult, if you can push when it's more difficult, that like you can generally, uh, improve your business for when, you know, the summer comes again. Um, and hopefully we like, we're in some sort of spring nowadays. So <laughs> what's, what's the best way to be, I mean, to be able to, to be faster when you go up the mountain. So not, not having overextended during the summer, it's a big thing. So if you look at, if you look at our competitive landscape, like people over hired and diluted the quality of their teams massively over like 2021, early 2022. That was, that's, that's a big thing. So you just overextend and you just, it's, it's, it's very much a bad trade in the way that you, you, you dilute the quality of your workforce, but also like you have, you have a whole, a whole lot of time and effort and, uh, you know, blood, sweat and tears just to go through, to just go and like basically shrink that workforce down and not upset too many people. And, and you also said, if you fire anyone, like we, we, we've never, uh, I mean, we have some turnover, uh, but we never went through, you know, like layoffs per se. Mm. Um, and you want to have some, some amount of turnover. Um, 
so like that on all of extending in, in the summer is a big thing um and then second thing is just to be like you want to have after the first summer or so you want to have in a business that's resilient enough to at least pay the bills so you can be focused on you know on, on expanding the business yep. there's all sorts of difficulty in terms of like exploration versus like exploitation as such or just the, you know how much do you explore when and how much do you focus on one thing and um the math behind it is more explore as much as possible during the summer and then basically be more focused during the winter um it tends to it tends to work um now it depends on like how much comfort or like if you have a bit of leeway it's probably good to you know expand a bit beyond your core during the winter um which we which we have done through you know tc for example and through um a bit more iteration on you know incubating and and, and uh, helping you know earlier stage teams um and yeah i think i think these are these are these are pretty useful principles in the same line of thoughts we talked about you said focusing you know in the winter mm -hmm. let's say you don't know exactly what you want to do because you know for example you build a company it doesn't really work mm -hmm. or it works but not well enough mm -hmm. and you said before you should focus on what you're good at right but that's in theory right if you know what you what you what you want to focus mm -hmm. on how do you choose a focus when you're not sure yeah in business, so if you're not sure it means if it's not obvious you should still be exploring um and if you, you if you do have do have a you know a spike you do have like a, you know a very good competency in one domain it's not um this is more or less what i did after the first business when i was investing i would just i, I would advise some companies i would just get you know x percent whatever x basis points or so of that um percent of the of the cap table as an advisor over let's let's call it two years and then just uh it's it's a difficult exercise in like managing the alignment because a lot of a lot of value you bring as an advisor is often during the first few months but you tend to have mm. to be committed to the team for a few years and then there's also a trap there if you're not conscious enough or if you're not strict enough about your own time like an eight hour a month can turn into a full-time job mm. but uh but that's that's halfway between you know, exploring and then you know and, and still you know diversifying so you still develop your your core skill set but but through you know expositions to 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 um, um yeah exposing yourself to like in, enough enough teams and so on and there may be one one team that you want to join at some point um but not like it's i, I used to have this discussion <laughs> with um uh, I think it was 2014 or so, so after my first company was like, people were like, oh, you should focus, you know, so, so like, I was like, just, you know, not naively, but just very honestly, just saying like, if I don't know what to focus on, like, it's, it's pointless. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, <coughs> so I think there's phases where it's pretty normal to have like a bit of a, like a gestation, like a basically like, a, like a bit of learning and just sit, sitting back and such. And, and um, I think it's good to be curious and just keep your ears and you know uh, eyes peeled and so on and just making sure that um yeah, you don't miss an opportunity essentially mm. um there yeah it, it's it's tricky because um that's really if you really have no clue about where to work and so on but then you, you know you have a certain competency that you, you can help enough people and and again, it's even if it's an advisory role, it should be akin to co-founding where you should be quite careful or you should be quite conscious that, you know, these are people I want to work with and I trust them and so on. That's, that's another dimension. If you, if you have a bit more of a hunch of like a certain space that you want to work in and so on, then just learning by doing is the best. So if you have people who can trust you with, you know, a bit of a, a bit of seed funding or so, it's, it's pretty fine to just take a bit of financing and then just and go and you know and explore a certain space mm -hmm. uh again it's easier when you when you've done it several times um but it's yeah a lot of things you just you only discover by by talking to people and by you know iterating and by just you know by trying as well so it's um that's it's, it's not an easy problem um but but it's difficult for everyone so you know it's like <laughs> it's a uh, the, the most important thing is just to try. Uh, 
So you build a few companies, some work well, some work less well. And, but all of them, you could have continued, right? Mm -hmm. But you decided at some point, I'm going to leave this company at least because what's finite is your time, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the most important is what do you spend your time that is finite on? Mm -hmm. And you have Steve Jobs who said, I mean, it's kind of a fa famous quote from Swiss, uh, Steve Jobs, which is something like, I'm pretty convinced that what separates successful entrepreneurs from, from entrepreneurs who fail is just never quitting. Mm -hmm. Resilience. And in entrepreneurship, resilience is really seen as this thing that's a key strength. You should never let go. You should never abandon. You should never quit. And by definition, if you never quit, as long as you survive one way or another, you can't fail because you're not quitting and you're trying to find solutions. And at some point you'll find one, right? But you told me that, and it was really interesting because I've heard this theory also from some other entrepreneurs, but not many actually. Yeah. You told me resilience could be a bad trait. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. apply that to business, investing, and even relationships. So resilience, what does it mean? Essentially it means that you can sustain a certain amount of pain for X amount of time, you know? So like in, so this is what I say, it's the bad thing I've learned from swimming and there's only a few bad things, but um, I, I've got this capacity of like basically having no safety switch. So basically I can push and I can go and f do my race and then just go and uh, basically I have to puke because I've pushed so much. And it's, it's something that I actually ended up uh, hurting myself. I just opened my abs like 2011 or so, but essentially going back to sports a bit too aggressively. Mm -hmm. and, like, and then some things like this, and like, um, that's why I actually have, I have a PT now who basically tells me to stop. Uh, so I think yeah, there's, there's, it's the same sort of, um, same sort of, you know, there's things that can you know, help you go in a certain direction, but resilience is only useful if you're actually going in the right direction. You know what I mean? It's like, and if you go in the right direction, at least you, you give yourself a, I think it works well. So Steve Jobs, would call it, it works well if you're still open-minded, as I was saying earlier, it's like you, you need to walk this fine line where you need to be assertive enough about what you're doing, but you also need to listen enough to other people. And it's really difficult to find. I think this is what makes entrepreneurship like, so, so difficult is that you need to be quite realistic as well about, you know, what, what, you know, can be achieved at least in the short term as such. You can be delusional about the long-term goal, but you still need to be, you know, you still need to, 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 to go through, you know, achievable, like uh, shorter, shorter term, you know, steps or so, um, because, because you, you, you'll need to be able to prove whatever to go from different funding rounds. You need to be able to prove, you know, that you've reached certain KPIs or such as there's, there's a few things to reach, but I think, um, yeah, I think too much resilience may just mean that you just you may not be able to discern what's good and bad feedback. And you just like, oh, you think that, oh, like it's a bad time. It's normal. It's part of building a company, but I think it shouldn't be an, an excuse like to, to not listen to, to, you know, to, to, to feedback and so on. And, um, and there's an aspect when you have, once you have product market fit and so on, there's an aspect like you could apply to interview where, while we've gone through several, you know, cycles where, we essentially lost competitors. Some, some, some have just done it. Some just completely disappeared. Some have more turned into, uh, you know, investors essentially more, more, more like the 2016, 17 kind of, uh, generation of market makers that turned into investors essentially. Um, there's a, there's a few left. Um, so you, it's true that there's once you, once you have product market fit, it's probably a good quote, but before that you still need to be able to, to change direction and be, be flexible enough really. Um, so there's, there's a balance there. So I think it's a much more nuanced argument than just saying, uh, be, be resilient. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a, there's a limit to that. Is it the same in personal relationships? Oh yeah. If you are with a girlfriend or a wife and it's not going well, yeah. like how much? I'm, I'm someone who stays in, who stayed in bad relationships for too long, many times. <laughs> <laughs> So I've been very resilient as a, no, I don't make that But that's a great anymore. example, actually saying. But I behave the same way. Yeah, because, yeah. because I'm the same. I, and I always said for businesses, always super resilient. You can't kill me. You can really hurt me badly, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you can't kill me. Investing in crypto is the same. You make millions, you lose millions overnight. In mm -hmm. Luna, it happened to me. 
uh, it just like, but you're still there, right? Like a cockroach, like Bitcoin is for, uh, it's a financial cockroach. Yeah. Like you want to be a cockroach, like you can never be killed. And I always prided, prided? I mean, I always pride myself as saying in a relationship, I consider f f falling in love is very difficult. Mm -hmm. like for me, it happened three times in my life, right? So it's something that's, let's say, rare, special. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen like that. You don't have control over it. And the person in front might be not the best fit on like everything, but because for me, love is sacred. So I'm not going to leave this relationship. I can kind of, provided that the other person has the same mindset, kind of repair through things until the thing is kind of polished mm -hmm. and better. So I'm never going to leave if I'm in love because it's so rare, right? So I mm -hmm. put the love or falling in love above anything else. And I can take any pain. Like, and I was like, I'm never going to leave because I'm not a quitter. Yeah. Right. But you can get so hurt with that. Yeah. I think and it's... how long do you stay there when, I mean, is quitting for losers basically. Right. So I, <laughs> I used to be in your mindset and I've changed my mindset. <laughs> I've changed my mindset because, uh, um, yeah, especially when, um, I think there's many definitions of love as such. I think it's uh, what, what the, the way I would define it is more someone who generally helps you to grow and be happy. Mm. Um, and I, and I think, yeah, if, if, even if you've fallen in love, but it's that, that happens, that person may be like very controlling or, or um, uh, doesn't help you to grow or be happy essentially. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I change that, but, but I, I, I was in your, I was in your camp for many, many years and I learned that the hard way. So whatever, like it's, it's, it's part of, uh, it's, it's, it's part of life, but, um, yeah, so there's, there's very, very close similarities in terms of like behavior or pushing in one direction. Uh, um, and yeah, it's not, it's not easy choices to make, but, uh, but yeah, long term, long, long term is just healthier choices to make. I mean, I, for, for, for myself, it's been, it's been the case. Very so, so the takeaway is resilience could be a bad trait. <laughs> That's a good one, actually. Yeah, you need, you need it. You need it for, um, once you, it shouldn't blind you, basically. It's like, it's, it's imagine your bulletproof, it shouldn't be like, being bulletproof doesn't mean that you should be running, you know, across, you know, crossfire all the time, really, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's like many things, it's, it's better if it's balanced. You said you've been investing for many years. Mm -hmm. How important is investing to you and to people in general? Um, for me, it's like, it's quite, um, I mean, I started so early that even when I had gap years and so on, like if I, if I somehow, um, I'm not leaving winter mute for many, many years to come, but uh, if I, if I had to stop and sort of retire. I would not be technically retiring. I would still be essentially investing. And I think I like the, there's different dimensions to it. There's, um, it was more, it was more trading from let's say the age of 12 to, um, like early thirties or so. And then I, the last decade, I think I've barely made any public market investments and I've always really just focused on, on, you know, uh, private markets as such that a startup to like pre IPO deals, uh, because I found I had better edge as such. Mm. So I think there's a, there's a double dimension to it. There's, um, there's a, there's something that touches my, um, like my need to be competitive as such. So, you know, the, the rewards of, uh, it, it's, n it's less about money. It's more about thinking that, oh, I've been able to back the right entrepreneur, like buy the right people and so on. Um, but is it because of you care about helping the right people build the right things or, and, or, and I don't want to say an ego side, but I felt, I always loved investing because I was thinking I, I can, you know, with grades, I can have the best grades, but some other people can have the best grades mm -hmm. with a job or with a business, you can build a good business, but other, I mean, business is kind of different because if you build a great business, it means you're doing some things right, mm -hmm. right? 
But with investing, you can really believe in thesis. It's a very personal thing at the end of the day. And you can go against the crowd and kind of prove yourself right mm -hmm. or wrong and realize, man, I really understood some things. I mean, there's also luck involved, mm -hmm. obviously, but that other people, you know, for more investing in tra uh, trends and crypto is definitely one of them. A few years ago, you know, even 2018, 19, most people thinking crypto is shit. Even earlier this year, most mm -hmm. people thinking it's shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, you stay there and like, man, I really understand something that other don't and it helps you feel kind of good when the thesis works out. Yeah, that's why, that's because you're ahead of a certain curve that you get, you get rewarded, definitely. And to be honest, you can put entrepreneurship to a degree as part of investing. You're investing your own time and sweat and into, into, it, it's much more narrow, it's much more focused, um, but it's, it's also, a, it's also, you know, a, a form of, yeah, a form of investing. But um, on the, yeah, I think there's also a dimension of like investing. You can, you can be really cool people. I mean, across the, across the globe as mm. such, I think you can meet a ton of, I mean, for me, I meet a ton of people who are much smarter than me. Uh, so there's, there's a bit of an intellectual, you know, endeavor there. Um, it's good to feel that like you can help them along the way. I think because, you know, if you're an entrepreneur investor on top of it, that like you've been there, you've struggled at some point, you had a hundred, hundred no's to your uh, to, to invest in your company. And then you feel like, okay, well, you know, I'm helping, helping a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the aspect of creating jobs or so like it's just, I mean, it's, it's, especially if it's tech companies, it's, it can be questionable at some point if you're more creating net, you're creating job or not. Um, I think it's, you know, just, just backing people who just otherwise would be quite unemployable to be honest. Mm, so, absolutely. so I think, I think it's just, so it's more like supporting, like helping in that way. It's quite rewarding to be honest. So, yeah. um, even if sometimes it takes you 10 or 15 years to see your money back, but that's, a, that's another problem. But I think, I think that aspect is quite interesting. So the entrepreneurship by proxy is quite interesting. You said you met a lot of people who are smarter than you. What's your definition of smart? Uh, so there's. At, at least two definitions which are quite different. I appreciate people who are very good at abstraction. So the more like whatever the, the, the genius mathematician and so on, and people who can mm -hmm. solve, you know, interesting problems. That's, that's one thing. But I also love people who can like are very good at communications as such as so synthesizing like complex things into something simple. Um, that's something I'm hardly working on, like very, very, uh, uh very, very much working on. Um, and it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. So, you know, helping, like you see, you have a data scientist in your team and I, he can probably just do, you know, a good, good amount of things. And then, um, beyond that, like, can everyone, you know, can everyone understand what he says when he gives a report and so, <laughs> you know what I mean? And people who are able to do that, articulate yeah. that complex things that for everyone else or most people to understand, uh, it's a bit of a, still a bit of a, an art of magic to me. Uh, so I'm trying to learn from people like this. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few things that the, the third part of, uh, sort of is, is it kind of overlaps communication, but like people as, you know, as we discussed, like who could good as selling slash building trust, I think it's quite, quite a, like it's, it's a, being socially smart as such mm -hmm. is, is, um, it's very good. So you need, you need, you need a bit of, you know, you need, you need all, all, all these things together to, to, to make it work really. One of the ways that people measure intelligence is IQ. Mm. And you told me you have an IQ of about 146. It 70. depends on the measurements and it depends on, the <laughs> but it was, it's quite, it's quite a long time ago. I think people can work a bit on the IQ test. So I tend to, Did you? um, yeah, I think 137 was the first score and then you can work a bit on logical tests and so on. So you worked and then you did it again. Yeah. And then you just go like to 147 or so. But it's very, it's just, it's just very, very like, uh, it's very specific kind of, I think it's only meant to measure the success in the school system or something like this. No? Yeah. Most likely mm. like this GMAT thing or this GRE mm. thing. But the, the reason I'm talking about that is because you told me, cause I asked you, I was like, man, you speak, you know, whatever you learn 10 languages, learn six instruments. And I asked you, what's your IQ? And you said, oh, last test was about 147. Einstein is about 160. And then you told me that you really 
hated being called a genius, you find uh, it yeah. an insult. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so uh, I, I, I really, I think, I think only like the genius side can only be for I to define ideas. And I think it shouldn't really be used for people because I think it, uh, two, two things it does. It kind of puts people in a different category of human beings, which is, which I think is a terrible thing to do because it discounts the fact that, uh, the genius in question may have spent years and years and years working on what they've achieved. Mm -hmm. And I think it discounts the effort. And also it kind of finds an excuse for other people not to try to do the same thing. And which I think is just really sad because it means that that, that person actually may not be a genius, they're like, they're like some, some natural talent and some, you know, area as such. But I think it's, it's so much, it's often so much more about doing and trying things that I think is just, um, when you're talking about instruments or language learning and so on. So many people will tell you, oh, it's just so much easier to learn a language when you're a kid, essentially. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of true, but, but it's kind of false as well, <laughs> because, because <laughs> when you're a kid, you're just being fed, you're being pampered, blah, 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 and so on. And the only thing you have to do is learn a new language and maybe learn some motor skills as well, but, but essentially learn a new language. If you think of you, if you were as an adult, if you had the, you were fed, like you didn't have to worry about work. The only thing you had to do is learn a new language. I'm pretty sure you'd learn a new language within like not record time, but like, so, so it's just one of the things that I find that, so essentially I have the same sort of frustration with the sort of term genius. It's sort of, it's like, it's a bit of, um, uh, it's, it's to use as an excuse to put a barrier why there shouldn't be a barrier. Like people should just try to do it. And so, so you, you think that people would give less merit? to the fact that you built an amazing company like Wintermute by saying, oh, you're a genius. So basically you were kind of meant to build a business like that without looking at, Hey, I've built another three businesses before that were not really scalable, scalable, not really working and so on and so forth. Right. So it's basically saying it's finding an excuse for the reason you're never going to achieve something by just saying this person is a genius, has a high IQ and therefore it's normal. I feel better if I'm not able to achieve things or if I'm not even trying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's exactly what people should avoid essentially finding. Like we were talking at, at some point about procrastination and so on and distraction of social media and so on. As it's, it's typically the sort of things that, you know, uh, you know, if you want to achieve that just, just, just try it, just do it. You know, um, there's, um, there's, there's a few quotes. Um, don't remember his name, but he worked. He, he became a billionaire because I think he was, um, he worked with, um, Jim Simmons, um, you know, essentially in the, in the hedge fund space. So it's, it's probably like a, a math prodigy, at least. I don't know if you want to call him a math genius or such, but, um, but then, you know, there's people who are like number two after very, very, very smart people who did very, very well. And then their way to do it is like, well, I was only two hours behind that guy. So basically he had to work like two hours more every day to, to play catch up. But it, you know, with stamina and with, you know, some, some other, other traits, you know, they could, they, they could essentially catch up with the, the, the you know, the so-called geniuses and so on. So, um, so I think it's more like, you know, people realize that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a barrier. Um, so you believe in hard work oh. eats talents for breakfast. Oh, massively. <laughs> like, That's massively. the quote you were looking for. <laughs> yeah. I think it's better to go for people who are very honest, you need honest people, people who are smart enough and then very hardworking as opposed to like a very smart crook, you know, like you just, uh, that's, I mean, that's another dimension, but, uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, I think hard work, you know, the smart crook reminds me one of our first co-founder in my first company who, I mean, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You're 22. You're like, I'm going to find some other people who are smart yeah. and different. Mm -hmm. And these dudes had studied in, uh, Stanford, I think, or Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, Berkeley, you were school, you know, amazing. And after a few months, I realized that first there was a lot of blah, 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 mm -hmm. bullshit, but also that, you know, you start a company, you're basically roaring, um, against the current. Mm -hmm. So it's already extremely hard, but I, I was realizing that he was doing, he was 
rowing in a different direction than us. So you're against the current and then you're going to di different direc directions. Yeah, okay. And his goal was to, you know, get clients to then just say, look, I got the client per second, do the work. So therefore I, I deserve more shares. So the whole complete wrong dynamic. So he was a very smart dude, but not uh, the best values. Mm. And after a few months, and it's the last thing that you think when you start a business will happen. You're like, oh, we're a few people. We come up together. It's going to be so hard. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, because you don't realize that co-founders issues is the main problem in most businesses that fail, right? It is. It's, it's, it's documented, but not talked about for some reason. So, and then I remember after a few months, just having to make the decision to say, man, this guy, we need to fire him. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in this <laughs> meeting room. <laughs> telling him I was crying like a baby <laughs> because it was kind of like a relief to have him leave. Yeah. But also I was so like, man, like feeling like he was, be he had betrayed us because I'm like, you're not in the same, how can you not be in the same vibe and mood and have the same values as us and go try to get your shares mm. and everything. And just there like crying, crying, crying while fi firing him. And that mo that day, when he saw me crying like that, literally like a baby or in French we say crying like a Madeleine, like mm. I was crying so bad, like someone had died, you know? And then that day he became like more human. He was like, oh, he realized that he was basically being a crook yeah. and uh, he had acted badly. And then he basically kind of like settled easily and realized he had, but yeah, so definitely finding people who are, who have like good values and uh, smart, hardworking, but often the smarter the people, the more they might be, they know they're smart, especially if they're young, kind of have too much ego. And also they might be less socially good because the yeah. IQ is high, but the EQ is not that high. Which leads me to the question, what would you choose if you had to choose between high IQ or high EQ? Uh, my EQ is very high. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had to choose one or the other? Um... I think EQ, especially in the the era of AI and so on, I think EQ just wins massively. Why? Um, because I, I think it's, I think there's a great equalizer in terms of lots of things that I basically measured as part of IQ in terms of logic and so on that you, you can get a computer to do it. And then um, it's 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 more about there's a few things that are much less scalable as such as uh, yeah interaction with people. Mm. So. Um, so yeah, I think I think this is this is more this is more crucial, especially when the world where there's I mean with most of social media where things are quite anti antagonizing and so on, it's like being able to to be a measured diplomat in many situations is quite useful. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would I would I would value EQ, uh, I value EQ more. But you know, I think you you do the best if you have really high EQ and then at least an average um, uh, IQ. What's your biggest life learning from these last crazy 10 years, working super hard, sleeping four hours a night, going through multiple businesses, making a lot of money, going through a marriage mm. that didn't work, then going through another marriage. What's the key thing that you think is the most important? Um, Communication is the most important. <laughs> That's what I'm working on every day. So I think, uh, and, and that applies to like company building, like the, the co-founder relationship is often beyond values. It's often about um, um, like who's working on things long-term and who's working on things short-term. People who work on things shorter term have less worries because they can, they, they can hit, you know, the, the feedback loop is quite fast. Mm. But people who are working on things long-term and it has to be done, um, communication is key there because you have to explain like, oh, this is why I'm spending that time on this thing because, you know, it will be really useful in the future. And that's something, uh, that's something I learned the hard way here and there, just, uh, through, through different ventures, to be honest, just because I tend to think really long term, I tend to think it's, ob it's obvious to me and I'm not always the best at explaining why it's obvious to me. <laughs> uh, what's an example of something that's really a long term thing that you're working on that's obvious, but most other people would not understand. Um, nowadays I don't have like an, an obvious example on, but when you started, when, I, when we started like Wintermute, I was, I was working on the BD side three years ahead of, you know, of, 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 you know, us really needing, needing that if we, mm. we needed to start, you know, the, the, to build a network there, 
but essentially like the APL thing we have today, like we started it in 2020 or so. So it's more about being like one, two, three years, um, you know, trying to, you know, ahead of a curve and it's more as the business grew, like we quite, I think it became easier in some ways because you, you cover more of the market and the choices became actually more obvious. Um, um, but I think, yeah, articulating, especially when you, when you think things, you know, uh, think of things or, you know, work on things longer term, it's just, it's just pretty key, pretty key to articulate. Um, there's another big learning is in terms of, um, we're talking about resilience and so on and, and you know, uh, like resilience, like too much resilience, not too good. Essentially it's sustaining sort of pain from various problems you have to solve. Um, being able to focus on, agree on the problems that you have to solve, you know, whatever, as a, as a couple or as a, as a team and so on is, is pretty key. So, you know, there's a lot of things you need to ignore. Um, hopefully when your team grows enough, that basically all the small problems should be solved by, by, uh, by team members before it resurfaces to, to the management, but essentially, um, even on the management level, it needs to be like, you need to, to have a good amount of agreement on like, which problems you're, you want to solve first and then, and, and you, you want to be aligned on, on the solution. So, um, so what are the 1% of the problem that if we solve them, will really move the needle and mm -hmm. the 99% that just don't matter for yeah. now yeah. and making sure everybody's aligned yeah. on and that. This is, and this is why resilience is, is useful because it's, if you're good at ignoring noise, then you just you use your resilience for, for all the things you need to ignore and, uh, uh, and use your resilience for like, saying no to all sorts of people that you, you, you don't generally have, you know, the time for and so on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think these, these two things, um, and still a lot, I'm still, you know, there's still no, there's no perfect, you know, balance, but uh, we mentioned exploration versus, you know, focus. And that's still, um, it's pretty obvious to me nowadays, like essentially the only rational thing I can have as, as even as a, you know, spending every minute of the day, it, should, it would be very rational for me to just work on Wintermute. And obviously you need to stay sane and so on, and you want to have, you know, a good personal life and so on. So, so I, I, do, I do balance this a bit, but I do spend, you know, still whatever, 15, 16, I don't know, 17 hours on on the company every day or so. Uh, That's why you sleep four hours. You still have two or three hours for your wife or for to do something, to exactly, eat. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, focus. I think, yeah, yeah. Just, just figuring out what's important and then, uh, putting, putting much effort there is, uh, is, is really quite, quite, quite key. Um, yeah. We have a tradition to, is a new tradition since two or three podcasts to close this podcast, which is to ask the guest, what's their biggest prediction for the next 12 months? Prediction could be anything. Could be anything. Ideally something that people would not agree with or would be shocked about. Interesting. Um, I mean, I'm too much in the crypto space to think of other things, but, uh, um, don't take it, don't I take want it, to as, know. <laughs> don't take it as financial advice, but, um, uh, I, I would be, I would be hopeful that we see, you know, BTC above hundred K I'll be hopeful. It's not in the next 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. Just with institutional interest and just see, see, see. Whether, so before 2025. Yeah. Cause usually we have this, I mean, usually there's not much data point, but you, you have the halving. And then after the halving, there is previous all time high, which is the same year, but we don't go much higher than that. So you think that we're basically going to front run the classic cycle path? I don't know. Did, did, did that work like this last time? I think we did three X. So like... I think 2020 previous all time high was 20 K, which was about the end of the year in 2020, no? That was, I think 20K was like Jan or Feb 2018. We saw a spike there. Okay. Was, and then, and then, um, back to 2000, then there was the halving 2020. Mm -hmm. And then went like to, you know, 10, 12K. And then it went spiked up to 20K. Yes. And it, and then I think around December or November, I might be wrong, 2020, we were at 20K, which is basically the previous all time high, mm -hmm. the same year of the halving. Mm -hmm. But you're saying within 12 months, which basically is, Still, them in twenty twenty four. 
Yeah, it's just a random bet, really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping, I was like, oh, man. I mean, the truth is, if people expect something to happen the same way, it usually doesn't really happen the same way. So people would expect maybe oh, a big crash now because we had one of because of COVID. So we <clears throat> tend to think in pattern, but the for, COVID for crash... For me, it's more a function of the size of the market that's still tiny and institutional interest. And it's, you know, it's a, that we know. So the caveat to that is that we're market neutral as such as a company. Yeah. <laughs> there's the, like, we don't really have a specific bet on Bitcoin, but I like the fact it's just convenient for, 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 for us as a business to see BTC going up because it means CNN and Bloomberg and so on speak about it. And then basically traditional finance has to, has to look into it. Um, I'll be hopeful. I think things like tend to, tend, tend to, tend to be a bit more volatile than what people think. Do you think that we'll go? 100k 150 whatever and then there's gonna be another big crash um because people are not thinking i mean the, you think with cycle a lot of people say oh this is the last cycle there are more institutional interest and then it's kind of over these chances of like doing big returns but with all the leverage in the system all the these meme coins all the people who are just excited to kind of gamble it's kind of I don't see how we can't have these booms and busts like for another couple of times, just the way people are trying, just the way psychology works, right? Yeah, I think there's still, there's still a continuous, like think of the market as a prediction machine, essentially. Um, I think it, it, you, you'll still have things going up or down because someone decided it was too, too expensive and, you know, um, so it's very much, you know, com constant competition about, you know, who, 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 who's predicting the price or who's betting on the price going up or down. Mm. I think in terms of leverage, you're, you're correct. It's, uh, um, I normally say people don't take any leverage. Like imagine someone has a 10 X leverage at 44 K it goes back down to 40. They just wiped out. Like it's just, uh, for me, it's it, for me, the, the, the best framework to use for crypto is just like, it's like startup investing. Imagine, yeah. like, imagine you just, you, you can't have loud leverage. You can't have any leverage basically on startup investing. You put your money there and it basically just run it off. Uh, and then and you forget about it for, you know, three, four, five years. Um, and, and, uh, and also think of like, that's for the downside management in terms of the psychology, but also in terms of the upside, I think what's really difficult with crypto is that, um, imagine the context of like, um, like an Uber investor seed invested at whatever, $3 million in 2008, and then they get a five and a half thousand X when they, when it lists. Would someone in liquid venture in a crypto space, would have, would, would they have Probably. kept all the way up to five and a half thousand? Would they have kept Probably their not. position? Probably not. So, <laughs> so I think it's a little sort of framework to think about. Um, I know some people who quite, you know, long-term investors who just basically put it in a cold wallet and just forget about it and just wait a few cycles. It's been maybe a good way to do things. I think it's, um, if you decide to, to be more trading than investing, that's a meaning as you trade back and forth to you, you look at things short term. Mm -hmm. You need to be ready. Like whenever you sell something, you need to be ready to buy it back, uh, you know, a certain level and have, you know, have a framework around this. And it's quite, it's quite, it's quite difficult. To it's do. very hard. Yeah. It's so, it's so painful to buy. It's mentally the mental pain of buying. Mm. That's why, yeah, it's so painful. Like for me, it's horrible. And actually, I mean, also selling when everything goes up, extremely painful because yeah. you're never going to sell the top and you're never going to buy the bottom. So except if maybe you have your special algorithms, but like it's, no, it doesn't work like so this. So you buy no. probably it doesn't, but like you buy and it's probably going to go lower and it's like a painful and like, oh man, it might go lower. So ah, maybe another 10% and then you end up just buying higher than you, if you, you know, than yeah. maybe just where you sold. So like the whole thing is such a mind fuck that is complicated. Like, <laughs> it's complicated. So again, the, the disclaimer is that we don't make money like taking direction yeah. bets. Yeah. But I can tell you that um, for like personal like equity portfolio or so like what, what, what I used to do, a, a more rule of thumb that worked well is that when you buy something, let's say if you're ready to take, let's say a 10% loss or 20% loss somewhere, when you make money on something, you should make at least three to five times more money on this. So the, the position, the bet that you, you took that works well, you should make 50, 60 plus percent. Mm. If you're ready to lose 20% somewhere, you, you know, you need to, to let your winners grow. And, and, um, the startup analogy is usually quite, quite useful because it's more like whenever you invest somewhere, you should look for like 
a 10x. So you should be ready to basically have your money sort of locked in and then not be able to have any liquidity, but also you should be able to, to think that, oh, like I'm, I'll make 10 times my money. Yeah. One, whenever it works, I'll make 10 times my money. And it should make you more patient when you've done like 2x or 5x and I just, just to wait for, uh, for a bit more. If you're all in the top names in, in crypto, like it's, it's probably difficult to get a 5x. Uh, um, so yeah, it, 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 I think the, the most important thing is, as I was saying at, at the start, is uh, it's just more to have a model to start with. It, it may be like, oh, okay, I'm ready to lose 10% on the losing position. I'm, I will be strict to, to hack out of it. But when it works, I, I, I let it run to make, you know, 30, 40, 50%. And, uh, and at least you have a model to work with. And then you think that, well, maybe, maybe cutting a 10% loss is too tight. The market is too volatile. Maybe that's, maybe that's true. But then it means that, okay, if you're, if you're only cutting when you're losing 20%, then maybe it means that you need to have to make, you know, 60, 80, a hundred percent, whatever it works as well. Um, and then in average, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll make some money, but I think the good thing with this is that it, it makes you think that, okay, if a position X, Y, Z is down 10% and I'm cutting, I can't have much leverage on it. You know what I mean? Or it just wipes you out. So I think it's, it's, I think, you know, too much concentration is also one thing and it's more, um, I think, I think the big way people do it wrong is if you can consistently make money, um, it's actually very difficult to scale from like a few hundred dollars to millions. It's not what you're trying to prove when you have a few hundred dollars. When you have a few hundred dollars, you're trying to prove that you can make consistently money. And then you can always, if you can do that in a, in a scalable way, you can always get someone, someone else to invest in you. And, you know, essentially you're running a fund or you're earning someone else's money, but, um, as long as you can prove, you know, how you've made money, essentially, there's, there's, there's a structure to it. Um, you know, and, and, and there's enough, and there's enough for a track record, you'll be able to, you know, to, to you basically just to scale from with other people's money. Um, so yeah, sort of the, you know, people aping and trying to make, trying to make millions out of a hundred dollars is, is just, is just not, is, that's not really a framework. It makes up for beautiful, uh, stories in the media. Exactly. But, but that's more of a, a fluke more, more often than not. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's just, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's the target, but it's definitely not what we're trying to educate people on uh, with this podcast. Thank you so much for doing that, man. That was amazing. Thanks for the invite.